Hi everyone. Well, in today's video, I'm going to get into what we know and what we need to find out about the collapse of the historic church in New London, Connecticut. This collapse occurred in a roughly 170-year-old church last uh, Thursday, January 25th. And uh, thanks to a channel member, Dr. Evil814, he alerted me to this story the day after it happened. And I just wanted to allow myself time to, to research this, uh, compile all available information, and, and really wrap my head around what could have caused this catastrophic collapse. Fortunately, no one was injured. Uh, it's really uh, quite shocking that a structure like this could come down all at once during the daytime. Uh, had this happened during an event or a service, there would have been dozens, if not hundreds, of people killed. So I think the locals need to take this incident and investigate it very thoroughly. You know, I'm involved in the engineering and construction trades, and uh, in construction they refer to a near-miss accident. And that's something that could have resulted in injury or death, but didn't, fortunately. But the idea is to treat a near-miss accident as seriously as any other type of accident to get to the root cause and to prevent it from happening in the future. And I think that mindset needs to be at play when they investigate what caused this collapse because it could apply to many other structures, not only throughout Connecticut, but throughout the United States. So I'm gonna do a quick overview of what this church uh, looked like and some of its history. It was completed in 1853 at a cost of $28,000 in 1853 dollars, which would be equivalent to $1.1 million today. The church was sold in 2015 for $250,000. This church has been actively used. In fact, uh, the congregants were holding regular events and uh, would have regular services as well, from what I understand. So this could have been really, really a horrible episode. Now, the city was quick to demo the remaining structures associated with this church, aside from an addition that was built in the, in the 1970s, because the walls couldn't be considered to be safe. There was a nearby dormitory, uh, nearby roadways. So the city, I think, acted appropriately to knock down the remaining structures so that they wouldn't pose a hazard. But it was a type of activity that really wouldn't lend itself to a deep forensic analysis. Uh, from what I understand, there's concerns about potential uh, lead and asbestos contamination in the rubble. So the local environmental officials are going to assess that to determine uh, what type of facility this material could be disposed of at it or if it could be recycled. So that means it could be many weeks before engineers have a close look as to what happened. Now, whenever there's a structural collapse like this, two things immediately come to mind. I'm a, I'm a geotechnical engineer, so one of the first things that comes to my mind is, was this somehow a, fa a foundation failure? The second thought occurs to me, is there some type of structural element failure? Now, these types of collapses usually are progressive in nature, in, in that the, the conditions leading up to the collapse are progressive. So you could have changes in the foundation soil condition and strength over time, particularly if they become wet or saturated relative to their original condition. You can have degradation of structural elements. The, the granite blocks had mortar and a number of these sections were had cracked or, or missing mortar. And when water is able to get into the crack and, and freeze, you get freeze-thaw action, which can further degrade the masonry structure. But uh, you know, usually these things happen over a period of, of many, many years, and to get a sudden collapse, it's either the coalescence of several small things that are failing, or the sudden failure of a non-redundant element, whether it's in the structure or the foundation. Now, I don't know what work has been done since the 2011 inspection. There was a thorough engineering evaluation done at that time, and in that report, they indicated that $700,000 in repair was needed at that time. As I mentioned, the church was sold in 2015, so between 2011 and 2015, I couldn't tell you whether any of these repairs had been implemented, but considering that the sales price was 
$250,000, I think you could reasonably uh, assume that that repair work had not been completed. And so as far as from 2015 to now, I, I don't know. There hasn't been a lot of information released. I understand there was a fire inspection, the most recent one in 2019, and didn't reveal any major issues, but I don't think it's a type of inspection that was as thorough as the 2011 more or less structural and condition assessment of the church. So in this video, I wanna get into the possibilities of is this a geotechnical failure or is this a structural failure? You know, I've done recent videos on the Washington Monument. Uh, that bearing capacity failure would have occurred for that structure had the uh, Army Corps of Engineers colonel had not uh, intervened and figured out he needed to enlarge and deepen the foundation. But the uh, Washington Monument was on the path to eventually have a bearing capacity failure if that intervention hadn't been made. And of course, the most famous example in the world is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. What you're looking at is a shear of the subsurface soils. It's a type of localized bearing capacity failure. So eventually when this rubble's taken away, I'm sure they're gonna examine it to see was there cracked uh, masonry elements? Was there missing mortar? But again, I'm having a hard time understanding how that could have led to a catastrophic failure without anybody noticing the poor condition in the run-up to such a failure. So I think, you know, everybody's thinking structure, 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 but I also think that the possibility of some type of foundation problem, a buried capacity failure in particular, really needs to be examined. So one of the things I'll be curious about for typical subsurface shear failures or bearing capacity failures, you'll get soil pushed up on one side. So in this instance, you would expect soil, uh, the ground level to be a little higher at the front of the church. Of course, the steeple fell into the, the church. And so the rotation would have been into the church uh, from the steeple. And uh, there's actually some photos. The mayor mentioned in a recent press conference that there had been some social media postings indicating the possibility that this steeple had already started to tilt towards the church some months ago. Since this happened, after the collapse, there has been circulating on social media a photo of the steeple and it appears to be compromised. So that's out there. And we've also been getting reports of observations of this steeple looking like it was leaning. You can kind of see that in these pictures here. There's also video footage of the collapse from a nearby street camera. And you can tell the steeple really is largely intact. It's fallen in at the base apparently so that the steeple could fall into the roof of the church. So it's like chopping down a tree. You know, the tree stays together until it falls to the ground. So let's look at some of these photos from the 2011 inspection report. We see examples of cracked mortar, roof damage, damage to the stairs, and water damage. So there's a couple of scenarios that occur to me here. If you have water that's not well controlled, either off the roof or around the perimeter of the building foundation, it can lead to problems both structurally and geotechnically speaking. I uh, was involved with a project for the installation of uh, some industrial tanks at an existing facility and there were a lot of constraints. We weren't able to do borings for that phase of construction. I had to rely on previous borings. And so I was concerned about how accurate the subsurface information would be at that time. So I decided that, hey, during construction, this was a massively thick mat. It was like five foot thick and heavily reinforced to make it as rigid as possible to span any localized areas of soft subgrade soils. And uh, I said, you know, when you open this excavation up, I want to be there to observe the condition of the subgrade. And I had a fiberglass rod that I would use as a probe. And 
it was a clay soil and I could push that rod with one hand its full length, which was four or five feet. Because the subgrade, the clay soils, became saturated over time. This new part of the foundation was adjacent to a floor slab and the underfloor drains had corroded because they, in their washdown process, uh, that they were, because of their processing at that facility, the water became acidic. So the drainage underneath the floor slab, the, the pipes were, were like sieves, and they would constantly leak water into the clay subgrade soils. And I can imagine a scenario like this with this church. If water was coming in and, and saturating more of the foundation over time, you know, Connecticut in 2023 has had either record or near record rainfall. In fact, it, December rainfall totals were twice the normal. Uh, January was extremely wet month with a big storm on January 9th. And of course you have these cycles of, of rain and then freezing. Uh, so it can contribute to, again, freeze thaw action of the uh, masonry blocks and the mortar. But again, if you don't have adequate foundation drainage, it is quite possible that the subgrade soils soften over time and lose their shear strength, and you could have a localized bearing capacity failure develop over time. So I think in addition to examining the ground level in front of the church to see if it's raised up, I think uh, who's ever heading up this investigation ought to strongly consider performing soil borings. So I, I would suggest don't rule anything in or out at this point. It needs to be a complete structural assessment as well as a geotechnical assessment, which I think the geotechnical part is often overlooked. So here's some interior and exterior images of the church. There was a basement level that contains a boiler room, so I'm not sure if the basement is a full basement under the entire footprint of the church or is localized to accommodate the, the heating equipment. So it looks like it's gonna be many weeks before the answers to these type of forensic questions are gonna be forthcoming. But again, I would encourage the local officials to take this episode very seriously. It could have been utterly catastrophic for, for dozens if not hundreds of people and, and not just the church. I mean, it's a, it's a local tragedy for the, the congregants as well as the community. I mean, this church was on the banner of New London's city website. So it's quite a historical building. You know, we seem to have a rash of these collapses. We had the apartment building in New York uh, that had a masonry exterior that collapsed. There was that apartment building in Iowa that collapsed. So, you know, Connecticut has warmed 2.2 degrees over the last 100 years. And in many instances in North America, warming temperatures also produce uh, additional precipitation. So you take aging structures, uh, churches, residential buildings, and you combine just the normal deterioration of the, the building and possibly the foundation over time with additional amounts of water, it's, it's not a good combination. So I think, unfortunately, there's gonna be more of these to come. I think uh, there needs to be more consideration aside from routine and thorough inspections, to install geotechnical instrumentation. A lot of this instrumentation was developed for dams and uh, underground tunnels, but it's possible to measure tilt. You can measure the changes in widths of cracks. You could automate this and have this data go over the internet, and you can have a dashboard in real time look at these values. So, you know, that sounds like a an expense, quite an expense. It could be on the order of fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, perhaps. But uh, you know, this church, I, and I think it's the city that's bearing the cost of the demolition and disposal of all this material. It, it's going to cost well in excess of the two hundred fifty thousand dollars that they paid for this building. And again, if you, I think that a little bit of money for instrumentation would be well spent. So I want to give a shout out to the channel members. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Thank you to those of you who have provided super thanks. And again, thank you to all of you who have liked, subscribed, and left comments. Please stay tuned for future videos. 
In the meantime, if you'd like to check out my link in the description, there's a free download of my guide to the biggest civil engineering disasters of the last 100 years.